Hello, everybody. Welcome to this web webinar on eSports. Uh, we've got the privilege today of hearing from some experts in eSports, so I'm really uh, thankful that you could join us today. The theme for today's webinar is going to be new landscapes for eSports, COVID-19 and beyond. So what we're going to do today, how it's going to work, is that after a brief introduction by myself, each of the uh, speakers, four speakers that we have uh, with us today, will be giving a brief presentation, no longer than 15 minutes, between about 10 and 15 minutes. I'll be asking them a series of questions on their uh, respective areas of expertise. And then we'll be having a, a group discussion, possibly around 10 minutes. And then I'll be introducing to you one of our uh, UCFB students who's been working in the area of esports and has founded an esports um, society at our university. And after that, uh, there'll be an opportunity, hopefully, for some uh, question, live questions from the audience. So very briefly to introduce today's webinar, I don't think it's of any surprise to uh, the viewers and the panelists, of course, that esports is becoming more and more prominent. And um, we, we can think of a variety of ways in which it, it has have, it's had increasing significance due to the um, coronavirus situation that we've been facing. So we've seen different sports reacting in different ways to it, potential substitutions of uh, sports with esports. We've seen uh, the Formula One esports series, for example, um, creating the virtual Grand Prix, which has been um, of significant success to the perhaps more subtle ways that um, the Premier League has been uh, involved in um, esports through their virtual tournaments in uh, FIFA 2020. So we'll be looking at some of these issues. And I, to, to introduce all of our speakers um, collectively, what I should say is that we're, we're very fortunate in that they represent a number of different nations. So uh, I think that's gonna add to the wealth of uh, today's webinar. So first of all, we have Rui Alexandre Jesus, who is president of the uh, Portuguese Association of Sports Lawyers and is director of international relations at the World Esports Consortium. And he's also a consultant at CDS Mayfair. He has held numerous positions in advisory and in-house roles, including legal management of the uh, Portuguese Non-Professional Football Players Association. And he's also provided consultancy to several sports clubs and sports federations. So next speaking, so I'm going through the order of the panelists today. So after uh, Rui, we'll be speaking to Chester King, who is the founder and CEO of the British Esports Association. British Esports um, was founded by Chester of, um, uh, from the International Group, and he has over 27 years experience in traditional sports uh, with Stoke Park, um, for example, running the pre-Wimbledon tennis events, the Bodles, as well as working for the Football Association, Lords, and the Rugby F Football Union. Chester is a board member of the Global Esports Federation and is a member of the International Olympic Committee's Esports and Gaming Liaison Group. After Chester, we'll be speaking to Trev Keane. He's head of esports at 7F and is a founding member of Ireland Esports. He has a varied and relevant experience in esports, working with rights holders and athletes who have been moving into esports spaces. He's a board member of the Northern Ireland Sports Forum, and he's also a lecturer. He's also lectured on uh, digital trends, esports, and sports marketing at various universities. He's also a judge and mentor for the US venture fund Stadia Ventures, um, looking at sports technology. After Trevor, we will be speaking to Jonal Van Schalquick, who is the co-founder and president of the Namibian Electronic Sports Association and vice president of the African Office of the World Esports Consortium. So without further ado, let's speak to our first panelist, Rui, who's joining us from Portugal. And Rui. Are you with us? Can you hear me? Just put, you can hear me too? 
Yes, hi Rui. So, Thanks for coming. So, <laughs> good to have you here with us. So, perhaps you could uh, begin by giving us a little bit of a background in esports. So, you're a sports lawyer, but how did you get into esports? Perhaps you could tell uh, the audience a little bit of what your expertise is. Sure. Um, first, uh, the usual words of thank you for the initiative, uh, but uh, really uh, to to. Uh, I believe it's a, um, a very nice gathering of persons and of sensibilities that you have here, that you see have be uh, you know, reunited and, and get together. And we'll see to, to, through the next minutes um, how, how rich they are and the, the, um, the opinions and the, the, the stories, the backgrounds of, of each one of us. On my case, um, it's as you said. Uh, I came. I, I came from sports. More. I, I, I normally say that I, I am. I normally represent the sports in the E. Okay, the part of electronic sports. I came not from the electronic part, but from the sports part to the electronic. And uh, the history. It's um, uh, simple. Uh, it's about uh, um, six years ago. In 2014, um, I was in a meeting in the in France uh, of uh, European sports lawyers, and uh, we we started to talking uh, to to talk about the arrival of sports in Europe, uh, the arrival in the sense of this of the beginning of many because some already existed uh, national federations and the approach of football clubs to sports. Um, and um, that was the start. We started to trying to understand what would change on traditional sports and how would esports uh, connect to sports, especially, uh, as I said, as you said, I'm from Portugal, uh, where there are 28 degrees at this moment. So you can see by the sun uh, uh, behind me. Uh, and um, I, I said this because it's always, I'm in Europe, so it's always um, a little bit different talking about this context in Europe or in America or in Asia. And, and we'll see that uh, in, uh, in a while. Uh, in our case, as you know, regarding sports in Europe, there is a strong um, regulation around sports. Uh, as, as we all know, uh, Europe looks at sports, of course, in a special way, in a specific way, of course, yes, but looks at it and uh, talks about it and worries uh, uh, about some things in it. And uh, with these sports, as um, uh, Europe started also looking at it, the governments in Europe, in a different velocity, started looking at it. So um, that was my approach, my beginning. Then I took part of the initial concepts of national federations of esports here in Portugal. Um, two years later, I was invited to be part of WESCO, the World Esports Consortium. And um, since then, I've been around and involving. Uh, I met, for instance, Chester, one of our guests, um, in the, the birth of, of well, in the first beginnings of the European Esports Federation, for instance. So I've been around uh, for a while now and also keep studying how esports can connect with, that is, the sports traditional, the, the world, the world as we traditionally see it. Great. Okay. So could you uh, tell us a little bit more about Wesco, your involvement with that, what is the significance of that organization for eSports, the World eSports Consortium? Well, um, it's, uh, of course, uh, I'm in a position that uh, since I, I am a part of it, I will only to, uh, speak uh, the best things of it, naturally. And, uh, well, I don't see any way, no bad things. The question is, I, I'm a little bit joking, but uh, this, the thing is, talking about WESCO is a little bit talking about the international panorama of esports. And that is something that is still in construction, as we know. There are, um, it's, it's starting to talk of the complexity of the international federations, of the older ones, of the new ones, of the, of the way how WESCO positions it, itself, not, not as an international federation, but as a consortium. 
Um, also looking at the specific of these sports, and that is the most important thing, that trying to bring what do we think that is the good things from sport to sport, because there are good things, in our opinion, that this traditional sport can bring to sport. Um, and, of course, looking at the specificity of sports that doesn't connect with old sports, with traditional sports, but that needs, and it's our conviction, a kind of world order, a kind of world harmony, uh, unity, uh, 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 international structure that can um, bring together sports uh, in, um, in a way that we can all compete together in the same conditions, bring concepts like fair play, like fair competitiveness, and all of those things that is important. And um, yeah. it's very, very important that um, there are uh, real uh, world um, entities, call it federations or consortiums, uh, that can, um, uh, because it's like in, like in, in traditional foot, like in traditional sports, and the best is, is example is football. Football is played technically in the same thing all over the world. But everyone knows that football is not exactly the same, or soccer in, in, in the States, it's not exactly the same. Uh, the way things are, uh, the way things are managed, the way the stadiums are, the way the players are, there are little, uh, s uh, small different rules. For, for instance, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, or in... That's why in traditional sports there are uh, uh, entities, continental ent entities, right? So the importance in our in our way of looking at it is to try to establish those intercontinental connections, um, helping people um, uh, in sports uh, bring them together as close as possible and with the most similarities as possible. I'm sure we'd all agree that there's a vital role in terms of glo global governance that um, your organization plays. So, okay, well, perhaps we'll come back uh, towards the end uh, with some of the other speakers to pick, to um, carry on with that theme of perhaps harmonization and how we can best uh, approach that um, if, from a global perspective. Um, I just wanted to focus on now a, a slightly more nuanced area of law. So uh, with sports, of course, generally speaking, uh, employment law is particularly important. Uh, it's a key area of sports law, isn't it? And I, I think for our viewers, it might be interesting to hear how, um, whether there's, there's any particular requirements of employment law for esports, in that often the players, the esports athletes, are quite younger. There's a fluidity between teams quite often. Are there any differences between how you should approach employment law for sports? and esports and uh, do you think there should be any changes do you think esports should look more like sports or um it, should it actually develop in its own particular way well uh you made a lot of questions not to, not one um but uh, let's Take start it. from the beginning <laughs> I, I should say from the last question you posed yes there should be uh, an approach but let me let me try to to, to answer First thing, uh, I believe that we all uh, know that esports is still building up, is still being constructed in a, in a uh, that is in an international way, in a regulation way, in the in the uh, it's still evolving. It's already very evolved, but it's still evolving. Okay, so taking that in consideration. Um, there is still a lot to do to understand. Well, first of all, we need to, to understand if people in sports really want to be closer to a sport. And that's it. That, that's a thing that nowadays still is it. I, I still don't think and don't see it being cleared. There are many people in sports that don't want to look at sports. Uh, close to a, a normal sport, okay? There are many people that do, there are many people that don't. So that is the first problem because um, when you talk about employment in, in contracts, we are very far of, 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 of finding answers to that. 
Um, again, global answers and general answers. Because, of course, I can talk in Portugal, you can talk, Chester can talk in, in UK, Trevor in... in because it, as, as we all know, uh, I believe most of people that are in esports know, probably, of course, people that are only now connecting to esports don't know, but even regarding uh, governments of each country, there are completely different approaches. So uh, you can't talk, it's completely different talk about the contract of a player in Asia, in, most, in many countries in Asia, than in Europe. Because there are the minority of governments in Europe are already looking at esports with some kind of legislation, some kind of... And that is one of the main necessities of having a, a global entity because we need to standardize something. Right. To re why? Why? To, re to, to reply to your last question. Because one of the things in my personal conviction that it's most needed in esports, likely uh, to, uh, similar to a normal sport, it's precisely rules for transfers of players, for moving players from one country to another, for signing for clubs, seasons. That is very, very important. Because of, uh, uh, um, um, a British player that wants to move, for instance, for a club in Italy, doesn't have a clue of what he's going to find in Italy. Or in, in many other countries. These were two example countries. But, uh, and I'm talking in Europe. If you, if you talk about uh, a Mexican player or a, a Brazilian player to move to a club in UK, it's, it's completely different because the clubs are different, the structures of the clubs are different. The, um, to, to end this point, you always have to try to understand the professional circuit of sports because at, at that level, there are already some standardized rules, but only in some modalities, in some games, if you want to, if you want to call it, and only in the professional, in the professional level. It's, it's otherwise it, completely different. Is entering it, leaving it, go to semi-professional clubs in semi-professional countries. So we don't have nothing of that. It's case by case. Okay, it's it's case well, by sure. case. Do you, do you feel the? I've just got a couple more questions for you, Hui. So do you feel that the impediment for having a Global Sports Federation and in, in internet or global esports um, type federation is uh, the, the impediment from it is from governments in terms of legislation or is it within the esports organisations themselves? And again, you know, this is something we might pick up on it on at the end. But for sure, we'll talk about it. But uh, uh, in my personal opinion, for my experience of these six years at the level I've been. Uh, it's both. It's, sure. it's people from esports uh, that, again, I, I'm not saying that. Don't re, don't. It's important always to be. We are still evolving. We are still constructing something. What I've been sensing in some cases is that there are people that don't want to construct, that want to. But again, there are people in football that say that uh, in uh, agents that don't want regulations when everyone is saying that should be should return the regulation of the, of football agents, right? It's a, in the example. The idea in football, and we can talk about the sports. It's, in my opinion, the majority of people want regulation. Sure, sure. It's it's a, a function of the business. Uh, the question in the near future will be to understand if the the the. The, the, those uh, little number of people that don't want it, if they have strong, uh, if they are strong enough to to block it, uh, but let's see in the in, in, in soon probably. Sure. Yes. Well, hopefully we'll be seeing more harmonisation um, happening. Well, thanks so much for that, Rui. We'll come back to you in a short while uh, when we speak to the panel. Thank um, you. In, in okay. the I'll be here. Thank you for that. So uh, let's switch now to Chester King, CEO of Hi, Alex. Esports. Hi, uh, Chester. So I'm going to ask this to all the panelists. Um, I think it's quite interesting for our students to hear how you all got into esports. You know, it's not 
in terms of a career path, it is, you know, it's, it, obviously it's a new industry. So I think it's always interesting for them to hear how you might enter into this. So perhaps you could, I mean, obviously you've reached the uh, upper echelons of, of the uh, business, but how did you get into it? Yeah, so as you mentioned earlier, I've got a heavy background in sports. I'm still involved in sports, but I've got a son that was born in August 2000, and I tracked the journey with him into esports. So, you know, one of the biggest games came out in 2009, which is League of Legends. You know, Call of Duty is another massive game, and I've tracked his journey, and it was about five years ago that I realized that there was a number of things in esports that weren't happening that you know, it wasn't happening from a British point of view. So I decided to set up a few initiatives, uh, one going to Rio during the Olympics and doing an event called the E-Games. And then the other one was setting up the British Esports Association with authority from the government. So it was really understanding the huge benefit uh, that esports has in society as an activity that I, I would, uh, there's quite a few comments that were just made <laughs> that I, I would probably categorically disagree with, but uh, I'm sure we're going to get onto that, uh, which is good. So under UK law, but it's always good. You know, esports is not, yeah, esports is not a sport; it's a game, and there is no one in the UK that wants esports as a sport. And the, there's a number of reasons for that. One is that yeah, you know, when we're going to schools and we're teaching the benefits of esports and activity, the last thing we want to do is promote people not physically act doing exercise. You know, there's some great benefits of esports it's not a sport at all and i sit you know as you said on the olympics board you know sport is sport esports is esports so i just wanted to clear that up so. yeah so it, obviously it's a long-standing debate isn't it um and it's not something we've looked at at ucfb our, our students have debated whether it should be considered a sport or not and the physical characteristics but yeah i mean i i can see obviously i think most people would uh, whatever your take on it is there are clear distinctions aren't there so um but yeah clearly there are benefits to esports aren't there you know we, we've seen this quite recently with the pandemic it's a way that people can make connections it's a way you know in this lockdown situation which we're all in it's a way of keeping people engaged in an activity that is is fun it's um you know it has aspects of um it, it's very competitive so could you um sort of um, from a uk perspective uh, let us know what activities specifically have been going on um, in esports in this country. Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, what's interesting is that gamers are, are continually gaming, but what I think the big shift over the last eight weeks is a lot of people who play traditional sport realizing that they can stay competitive, they can communicate with their friends. There's a sense of rivalry that can be done in esports. So we've helped a few national go governing bodies in the UK. Uh, so Basketball England, we're about to set up an NBA 2K tournament, which is a basketball game. We're working with the Association of Colleges Sports to do a FIFA tournament. We're working actually with the Army as well to help them because there's a lot of their service personnel that you know traditionally would want the socialization aspect of sport and they're missing that but by playing esports you're having the, those elements albeit without the physicality so i think the main shift that's happened is we've been we have never been so busy in our lives all my team you know work from home and we're literally flat out uh we had to change one of our tournaments that was the national finals for schools and colleges which was normally at insomnia uh which is a big gaming festival we moved that to be online, which we got our friends at the Newell uh, to, to uh, broadcast, which was fantastic. We were on the homepage of Twitch, streaming a, a great Rocket League, Overwatch, and League of Legends tournament. And then the other thing that we, yeah, we're working on is actually doing a UK schools and colleges Fortnite tournament. So a lot of the publishers um, you know, have really stepped up and really helped different communities, I'd say. And again, you, know, you talk about regulation, you know, every uh, publisher is the regulator for their own uh, system. So what I would say is there's a difference between uh, publishers that have franchised leagues and teams. So I'm a co-owner, small co-owner of the London Royal Ravens, which is the Call of Duty League for the UK. They have all these regulation and rules in place, how you do transfers, what you pay each player, how you do it. So I'd say, you know, the 30 main esports, there's three that are already on a franchise level that are very well organized and rules are in place. And I think you know, you can't have you know global rules everywhere because there's different um, uh, meanings of esports. So just going back to the sport in the UK, if something is classified as a sport, it gets government funding. 
right? So bridge sure. and chess is not a sport. So again, I, I don't think you can harmonize. I think there's certain things that you can set best practice of how to treat people and no toxicity. And one of the things I'd love to talk about is, is about coaching is that, um, you know, if you take a traditional football coach in the UK, they're teaching traditional sport. They've been checked, you know, DBS checked that they are, you know, don't have a bad background and they're good with children on a physical basis. The problem in esports is you might have a coach from Australia or from France teaching British players, and there's no checking of that at the moment. So Ilias and what he's doing at Resolve is a brilliant initiative where he's creating a verification that coaches in the UK anyway have gone through a certain criteria. So this to me, you know, what when we're te talking to sports bodies, they just don't understand, they haven't even thought about that. So I think where sports can help, esports e can help sport is understanding, you know, what these kind of, um, you know, contact risks are, are online. So I think there is, and I, I agree, there should become some common standards, global standards on coaching. I, I suppose those, those standards themselves should that there should be flexibility for each esports, particular esports. Um, okay, so um, yeah, I, th I think it's you. Sorry, yeah, Chester. So I was just yeah, I was just going to say yeah, it's, this isn't about standards. This is about safeguarding. It, yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's there's definitely commonality uh, to be done that, and I'd say Wesco you know, has initiated that as well. Going back to the point of um, how esports has been working with sports, do you think there's more potential for, in, in terms of future growth of esports, do you think it's going to come from partnership with traditional sports bodies and clubs, or is it going to, do you think it's actually the, the driver is going to be more specific esports tournaments, leagues being developed, and it, and it you know, really becoming its own separate entity, which it already is in some ways? Yeah, so of the different boards that I sit on, what's going to happen is the IOC and any esports activity that they do and the Commonwealth Games and any esports activity they do is going to be reinforcing sports video games. So this is esports that have a sporting element. And also there's a term of active esports. So that's like a game like Swift, which in my world is cycling. For some people, it's esports. So I think you'll see a strategy from each international federation in sport to have a gaming strategy. Certain titles you know, are very lucky, like football and basketball and cycling and rowing, I'd say, and potentially golf. You know, 53 million rounds of indoor golf was played last year, hitting against the screen. So is that is that golf? Is that esports? Is that simulation golf? So there's, I think, technical uh, support for certain sports. There are certain sports that have will have an issue, but what I think you'll see at uh, future Olympic Games and Commonwealth Games, you'll see sport more sports video games, and then you've got events like the ISF have a games. Global esports games are going to have an event at the end of the year, and they've got Ten Cents as their partner, which is the biggest gaming company in the world. And you'll see a crossover of sports video games, MOBAs, uh, sim racing, fighter games. But I think a lot of people are still cautious over the first person shooter in the Battle Royale games. But I know that there's, uh, there's another initiative that's going to be coming out that's going to support that. So I think what you'll see wearing my British esports hat is three or four different annual events. And there'll be basically a split of the kind of 30 different esports where those five will be done at that event. Those five will be that event. So we'll be able to promote the best British players playing those different titles. That's great. OK, so could you comment a little bit more on the recent announcements from the International Olympic Committee regarding the uh, regarding esports and also the Global Esports Federation's partnership with the Commonwealth Games? What is your feeling about those? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, basically, uh, the IOC uh, have done a brilliant job of basically trying to bring the esports community together. And what you've got to think is that esports communities aren't like sports. You know, esports communities are commercial organizations. They do a brilliant job, but it's their IP. You know, for some people, esports is entertainment. It's not a sport. So you've got different companies, a bit like Google and Apple and Microsoft. You know, they're not the best of friends. And in esports, you've got different publishers running their titles, competing for the same kind of viewership and the same activity. So what the IOC did in 2018, they created an event of sports and esports, and they got everyone together. And they said, how can 
esports help sport and how can sports help esports so um they set up uh, the first meeting last summer and then present back joined a meeting last november and he said look every sport needs to have a gaming strategy right and so i think it's interesting that the the ic is seeing that there's advantage you know learning technical skills that you know everyone is playing video games you know so why wouldn't they want to promote their sport and i think fifa and pez you know a, a great success stories i know in america you know a lot of children understand the offside rule by playing fifa right and then with regard to the global esports uh announcement of the commonwealth games you know the global esports uh federation are trying to help you know the big events just understand more about esports you know so rather than the commonwealth games that are focusing on sports they're going to be talking to organizations like the global esports federation to help them put together a esports activity sounds great so sounds like from our students perspective who are listening in there might be scope for dissertations and studies on to in, into how much esports is a gateway into sports and vice versa what is the relationship if you're getting involved in one how much does that encourage you to to uh, carry out the sport and vice versa do you think there needs to be yeah, more we, research in that area 100 percent. i mean we did a, a pilot in, uh, two years ago with west ham foundation during our half term and the ioc were there and sport england actually helped with the funding and this was where children did football skills they did uh, archery and they played rocket league so were you learning skills playing rocket league when you're playing football and vice versa but more importantly you know that there's both are great activities, and I think you're seeing is emergence of sport and esports promoting the values of sport and physical activity, and then the huge mental health and socialization benefits from playing esports. And I think, you know, one thing that we haven't talked on, but you know, I could go on forever, is about dementia. You know, so there's a big study happening now about dementia prevention. That esports is a great uh, brain training activity, a bit like chess and backgammon and those type of games that have been played for hundreds of years. But esports is a is a, a obviously a lot more kind of sexy uh, activity at the moment. So Imperial Health uh, and British Esports were working together, and one of the roles that I've got in the Global Esports Federation, um, I'm chair of Education, Culture, and Wellness, is we've got a big call with a number of different researchers and doctors to understand about esports and how it can actually help you know a number of lists so people want evidence you know we all know sports good for you we all we all know chess is good for you but i think you know esports hasn't been really uh fought you know looked after because it's all about how good is league of legends or how good is call of duty but it's our role and wesco's role and global role to actually pull together research to promote so that parents understand that actually in moderation esports is much better than you know watching tv or being on social media it's much better for you on a number of levels and i imagine the shift over the recent years and decades from esports being more of an individual type activity to bringing people together um, playing in teams is a big factor in this as well Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we we mainly focus on for, you know at school level team esports. You know, we promote the values, and I think once parents understand, you know, esports is always human versus human as opposed to gaming. You know, that's why the British government, you know, from five years ago was always behind it. They understood this was about human interaction. This wasn't about a kid sitting in front of a computer, albeit you do train that way. This was about socialization and you know, mental health. So most gamers, I'd say, are pretty happy and pretty uh, lucid in their communications as well. Great, that's really interesting to hear. Okay, well, thanks a lot for that, Chester. As I said, we'll come back to you again uh, in a little bit. It's a really great insight there. From Chester. So now we're going to move on to Trev King, who's going to give us an Irish perspective. So if you just bear with us for a few seconds, Trev should be coming up. Trev, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, that's great. So Trev, same question as I've asked the other speakers. What was your, uh, what's your background? How did you get into esports? Um, I, I suppose I, I didn't have the benefit of having a, a son um, born in two thousand, like Chester. So it's uh, 
it's been a bit uh, of my own discoveries on it. I suppose I've, I mean, for me, I had the first ever edition of FIFA back in, in, in 93. Yeah. So an indication of my age to students, but, um, you know, my father, he, he, he was over in Japan, he bought it home and, you know, we had to take, to take the, the cartridge out, take it apart to get, because Asian and, and European cartridges were different in size. So that was kind of the start of an interest, you know, in, uh, in the FIFA series, um, you know, coming from Limerick and, and being a monster man, I wasn't long before I got into, into John and Luma rugby and, and, and I've always held an interest on it um, throughout my work life. I mean, and I suppose in the last, in the last kind of nine years, you know, five in the esports space, I've been fortunate enough to work across gaming and, and esports. Uh, my, my foray into the, the professional world of esports, um, I, I ran a tournament, I, I acquired a license. I wanted to test the market for what the appetite was for football clubs to explore relationships with FIFA gamers. So, you know, worked with EA, um, got, got a license, ran a tournament, had the likes of Wolves, um, Hibernian and involved, partner with players that were fans of that club, but were, you know, top FIFA players at the time, created a series, sold that series to, to, to ding it for distribution uh, and really just used it as a, almost a pilot phase to, to, to see what the demand was, both from a club perspective um, and from an engagement perspective in terms of the content that came out of it. Uh, from there, that expanded. Um, I partnered with, with, with Gold.com the year after. A um, lot bigger scale, went across seven countries, 64 teams, purely focused on, on football, so bringing in the likes of Man City, um, Ajax, Fnatic Roma, you know, right over to the likes of Basel in, in Switzerland and, and um, Dynamo Kiev um, over over in the Ukraine and bought all their their um, their esports players or their esports representatives that they had in official capacity in um, same format distributed it on goal and did it live finals in um, in Holland. Um, on on the back of that, it kind of led to a, a shift in focus in that you know I realized that um, rights holders athletes. Um, you know, they were curious about this space. They wanted to know more. Uh, they wanted to to understand what was the opportunity for them in esports and in gaming. You know, and and I suppose that's a clear distinction of what was their strategy going to be. Was it a gaming strategy, um, or was it on the competitive side where they went into esports? So, um, started um, was approached by a, fo a footballer at the time, Christian Fuchs. Um, he was at Leicester City. And he wanted to learn, you know, what was the opportunity for him? He had a clothing brand at the time. He wanted to reach the demographic of what was um, the FIFA scene. So it worked with him and to develop that strategy. And he became the first active Premier League footballer to launch an esports team. And I've continued to, to, to work with Christian for the last uh, last three and a half years. Um, been very fortunate that that had a lot of first experiences with him. Um, including selling front the shirt for a virtual kit into the EA game and finding kind of on, I suppose, a grassroots gems, which is what his focus is um, for, for his team, some of which have transferred to the likes of Randers or LAFC in, in, in the real football world to represent them. Um, that, that has kind of led then into working with, with my the club I supported, Monster Rugby, and and defining their journey and you know it's led me to over the last three years working with rights holders from the women's national hockey league right through to um pro 14 and and various other bodies in, in this space uh, and recently i guess has led me to in the last six months joining the board of ireland esports and helping kind of shape the uh, the irish journey which is you know far behind what what's gone on in portugal probably in namibia and definitely what's gone on in uh, in across the water in britain Sure, I I just like to pick up on that. So that's a fantastic um, career path uh, that you've had, and I think the experience you, you've gained with football clubs and sports clubs is really interesting. So, in terms of the Irish sports scene, that you're saying it's a lot newer, uh, there's scope for growth. In terms of education, do you think there's anything particularly that's required on that front? 
Yeah, so, I mean, as I've said, Ireland Esports is kind of on the first leg of our journey into uh, um, the NBG role. And it's, you know, it's been great hearing Chester and, and Rui and, and we've, you know, we've been doing our research, you know, in the background, talking to the various um, various governing bodies around. Um, Ireland, I mean, Ireland is, is kind of in a, is it's paradoxical almost in a, um, in a world sense for gaming and esports because when you look at the country um we, sh we we should almost be leaders especially as a test bed in it because you've got riot games with the european hq you've got ea with a strong presence um in galway you've got you know activision blizzard you've all these top companies and then you've got the likes of google or facebook gaming um with their offices here um but yet we've got a very immature um esports scene and a very um uh, I guess Im emerging um, gaming community. So um, it's it's been interesting exploring it from that angle, you know. So you know, we we now know that there's true research that we've got seven hundred thousand gamers on the island of Ireland. We now know we've got two hundred thousand League of Legend players. Um, what we want to do is 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 to put in a, a framework, you know, for for these players that they have you know, the opportunities to, to develop and define the pathways of what they want to be, whether that's, um, you know, international IOC level athletes um, or whether that's, you know, pro esports players, but to understand the opportunities that are available for them and to understand the, the risks um, as well. I mean, it, it's great to talk about opportunities, but it's also equally important to, to, to understand the, um, the risks. It's all about putting as well in, in, you know, and I've said framework a bit, but safeguarding is very important. I mean, one of our board members is is Paula Pronti, who's a, you know, a safeguarding specialist from another NGB that has joined us with that specific purpose of, you know, putting together, you know, domestic protocols, but also putting together international protocols as well. So it'll be, you know, it's interesting to hear about Resolve. Um, and it's also about understanding where esports, you know, sit. I mean, you could argue all day, is it entertainment? Is it sport? The motivations for sport, you know, are clear. It, it, it's more about, um, you know, grant development for players. It's more about potential tax tax benefits for them. It's all about uh, freedom of movement, you know, to, to other nations for tournaments. So that, that that's probably why you hear um, athletes pushing, the, for, for esports athletes pushing for that. Um, it's all about having a classification. And I think, you know, Rui at the start, you know, talk about, you know, world alignment. You know, you go to different governing bodies and you see where their allegiance is, whether it's Department of Culture in Denmark, who look where esports seems to have fallen over under, sorry, right through to New Zealand, which is, you know, affiliated to their to their relevant um, Department of Sport. So for us, you know, we're going through that journey. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, but it's very clearly about um, you know understanding what is right for the Irish, for the Irish gaming scene, and what is right for the for the uh, esports scene. Do you think there's any particular types of innovations that are needed? So whether it's to do with fan engagement or the development of an esports league, particular to Ireland. Yeah. So. Um, you know, the the world of esports is, is you know esports is it's almost like saying I play Olympics. Um, you know, it, it's no, you don't you 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 play the title on associated with that relevant publisher, and a lot of these publishers, uh, driven by the communities, you know, um, that that have their game, esports esports leagues have emerged. They're very much global, regional, um, in their approach. Um, so from that perspective, which is very much, I guess, you know, on the pro scene, um, but from that perspective, what we want to put in is, you know, domestic um, opportunities for for maybe, you know, that that bottom tier of of the triangle that 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 want to, you know, want to compete, probably don't have what it takes to be, you know, to be part of London Ravens in, in a in a Call of Duty um, scene, but want to be ranked and understand where they are in a domestic place and maybe have the opportunity for international invitations um with other countries and it's again it's just it's putting that framework in place for them right now i mean since we've launched it's been so interesting to um 
to have communication from from people to asking the question. Uh, you know, I, I've played this game. You know, I, I'm not good enough to, to to make it on a pro club, or there's no pro teams in, in the in our country in Ireland. I mean, we only have really one. Um, so what opportunities do I have? And it's put in that framework. And, and I suppose probably kind of it's sideways on, on the question, but all that comes back to is the the fan engagement part of it. Um, that comes back to more the, the, the two two aspects, the gaming experience of why is a rights holder getting into this and what do they want to understand and what they want to achieve? Do they want to leverage off the uh, off a particular community and bring that community or into their into their brand or are they looking to extend their brand a la Barcelona and how they do with netball and with basketball and move into into a competitive esports space? Both are very different and both bring different um, different risks uh, and opportunities for them. But it, first, they have to understand that before they can actually look at their engagement levels and what they want to do. Sure. And the last question is there, do you think there's a sort of need to have more in Ireland? A good way to start it would be... Um, what would be to develop uh, events in stadia, so the types of esports uh, events that we know have been gaining in, in, in the US, particularly tens of thousands of spectators at live esports events. Um, would, would that be a particular channel for development in Ireland? Um, so I, I guess through, through, through COVID 19, uh, and you know the pandemic yeah. we've seen Obviously, probably yeah. um esports yeah esports e e has adapted you know very quickly their their model you know tr tradition in the world of esports is obviously not a word we associate but your 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 standard path would be to play an online qualifier get to a regional qualifier and then go to to a LAN event um what publishers showed was that they could pivot very very quickly uh, and move into a, you know a fully online space, and I think that's been interesting. But I think you know, especially if you look at the likes of maybe a, a, in a UK sense, you know, ESL one maybe or, or or some of the DreamHack tournaments. It, it's nice to have it's nice to have uh, fans in a theater. And, and when the world kind of comes back to you know normal phase, I think you know it would be nice to see that again. And if Ireland can be you know, part of that journey, I, I, I think that's, you know, I think that would be incredible. I mean, we're, we're fortunate that, you know, True Monster Rugby Gaming, um, who, who are part of the U, UKLC and part of the uh, NLC, you know, we could have that opportunity down the years to bring, you know, some of the, to bring DreamHack to Ireland and run, um, you know, run their live finals in, in Tom and Park, which is, the, you know, the home of rugby. So we'd like to see it to become the home of rugby and League of Legends potentially in the future. But yeah. Great. Well, Great. hopefully we'll see that happen. Well, thanks a lot, Trev, for that. I mean, I feel it's a little bit of a whirlwind with with each of the speakers. That there's so much um, information I think we could hear from all of you. But thanks for that. Um, Trev, we'll come back to you in, in, a, in a short while. So to uh, John L. now, Van Schaal, quick. You should be calling us from Namibia. Hi, Janelle. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Fine, thanks. How are you? Fine, you thanks. Up? So you, yeah. you're calling us, you're in Namibia right now. Is that right? Yes, all the way make, down in Africa. <laughs> you make us jealous and tell us how warm it is. Janelle, you've just gone quiet. I can't hear you. Has... I... Oh. oh, yeah. Can you Apologies. Back? Sorry, sorry uh, about that. <laughs> no, yeah, we're actually moving into winter time now. So you can see my uh, cozy dressing. It's, it's sure, getting okay. quite cool. <laughs> it's getting um, warmer here in the UK. So, okay, uh, Janelle. Um, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your background? How did you get into esports? We've heard from some of the um, speakers so far that they've involved in, in sports and made that transition. How did you get into um, founding the Namibian Electronic Sports Association? 
Well, okay, so I, I started out as a gamer, but uh, what I collect, uh, it just re reconfirmed from the other speakers that uh, Namibia, we are a good 10 to 20 years behind the developed world. So um, I pretty much started out uh, on arcade games and console games uh, as a child. And from there, only in my late teens, I uh, got exposure to, um, a, you know, like computer gaming. Uh, and that fascinated me. It, it totally fascinated me. And uh, I, I set out in 2008, uh, we set out to, to host an event in Namibia, um, like the, the biggest marketed uh, gaming event uh, that we hosted until that date. And um, yeah, well, it was a tremendous success. And due to that, that success, we were able to uh, compile some momentum behind the force to establish uh, the Namibian Esports Federation. Uh, we have received a tremendous amount of assistance from South Africa. Um, uh, they assist us. <laughs> oh my goodness. Sorry, I'm not a public speaker. <laughs> this oh, no, is, no, I'm, I'm no, so no. out of my element here. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> not that no. I'm having an audience in front of me, but I know there are people viewing live. In any case, so yeah, basically we, we set out to host a gaming competition. So, um, yeah. And um, we marketed the event. We, we uh, opted some cash prizes for the event. And uh, due to the, the success of, of the event, we, we from there we moved uh, in, in association with the uh, South African Mind Sports Association. Um, and we worked according to their constitution to, to work on our own constitution. And thus we uh, formed NESA, Namibian Esports Association. Uh, so, yeah, it, it has been quite a, a long route. Um, just to get all the formalities in in place um but since then i feel nesa has has a uh, i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry i'm a, i'm having hiccups in my mind <laughs> it sounds like it's been a really interesting story in, in yeah, no, of... I've, I've had a hectic week behind my my back as well but yeah so basically in 2008 we hosted the competition was a major success. In 2009, we did the same. And due to the um, the success in two years, yeah, we were able to establish uh, the Namibian Esports Association. And uh, in 2011, we uh, got recognition from the ISF, uh, got membership with them. Uh, but that took us a solid five to six years be before 2017 that we were able to send uh, participants to the ISF World Championship. And since then, I must say, it has signif significantly increased um, the local interest towards esports, which has um, contributed towards our continued development. And only in 2016, I was approached by WESCO. Um, and yeah, since then, we we have uh, tackled the scene of Africa to to try and, um, yeah, develop esports in Africa. So, how has Wesco been of um, importance to Africa? Would you say? Well, since since now, I have uh, picked up a, a strong string with Wesco regarding the youth development. So, I feel there's a, a big. Uh, room for maneuver in Africa for for developing esports amongst the youth. Um, yeah, and we are especially focusing on our schools initiative. Um, uh, just to, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> this is not working uh, out. For me. No, no, that's fine, Jim. <laughs> So, no, I think I think it's really interesting to hear about esports in schools. So I'm I'm a member of White to Play, so um, one of the so I'm on the partnership committee of that organisation. And so one of the one of the main things of, of Right to Play is to help um, children, especially, to be involved in sports because it obviously it plays a transform transformative role in and it can be very important in a child's upbringing to be involved in sports. Do you think? Do you think there should be more charity involvement in esports as well? Because you know, especially in, 
in terms of in a developing country such as yours getting a child involved in using technology and again the other benefits that, that we've already mentioned do you think there needs to be more charity um, involvement and perhaps government support as well okay well of course we we face unique challenges in africa uh, i yeah. mean we are a developing continent overall um we we have other concerns besides sports uh, I mean, obviously, we still have people that don't, don't even have electricity and running water inside the, their houses. Uh, people living in shacks, not even proper housing uh, to, from, from the get-go. Uh, so there are major challenge, challenges in Africa, um, considerably, considering development uh, to first get onto the level of, of the international scene uh, before we are able to you know, grasp esports to to the full extent that the international, uh, um, you know, community is is uh, grasping at esports at this point in time. Uh, so there there is a tremendous amount of yeah because uh, the okay I'm I'm <laughs> I'm sorry I'm a I'm a bit <laughs> sorry I'm 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 still getting used to this. Okay, so, but let <laughs> let, let, right. let <laughs> me just just jump back into it. I, I'm I'm too caught up with with the audiences and stuff. Um, my apologies. Okay, but um, yeah, basically, yeah, N Namibia and uh, Africa, we are, we are faced with with unique challenges. So obviously, we we have a significant amount of development to catch in. But besides that, we also have um, people who grew up to so this. Not only the physical uh, challenges of our environment to overcome, such as the provision of electricity and internet uh, to you know across the board to to our communities, but also the people in in positions of of um, uh, you know like power um, who have a specific mindset. Um, you know, of of course, we have the other priorities in Africa, but uh, the mindsets also in Africa is is a great deal to overcome. Um, just to to grasp the importance of esports as a new developing sport within Africa. Um, so yeah, because I feel there is a lot of opportunity and educational progress uh, that is to be had from esports that can complement our current educational institutions um but yeah it is it is a matter of time to to overcome certain obstacles for africa just to catch up with the rest of the developed world in 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 the sense of infrastructure job creation um you know uh, securities all of these sort of things uh, that we still need to catch up with uh, before we are able to fully indulge into the let me say luxuries of of sports um so i know football is a major factor within africa it's it's uh, hugely supported and i i feel there's much room for for esports as well uh, to to get a bit of the limelight uh, through the means of establishing computer centers within public schools um you know just to encourage uh, the development of of technology within Africa and African communities, and especially on the educational level within schools and universities. It's really interesting to hear that perspective. And as you say, it's, it's, it's at a different level, there's a different infrastructure requirements. So hopefully, there'll be that investment to see esports and obviously greater technological use, um, more, speaking more broadly. Hopefully we'll see that happen more in your country. So thanks very much for that, Jonelle. And perhaps it might be that when we, in speaking with the other speak, speakers, when we bring them back now, so uh, I don't know if uh, our team could bring the other speakers back. Perhaps it might be a question we could ask uh, to uh, Chester, Rui, and to Trev, whether there could be any collaboration and opportunity to, for their organization. Um, even the West Coast develop esports in Africa. So yes, if, I don't, funny enough, there's going to there's going to be 
quite a big There's announcement no coming probably in the next seven days about helping African countries to do with uh, exactly what you're saying. Yeah, right. I'm okay. sorry, guys. I'm so nervous. <laughs> it doesn't so you're show. Doing great. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing great. Doing yeah, great. it's all it's all a new experience, I think, for all of us. This you know, this strange concept of webinars. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, I'm I, sorry. I, I'm like a small town girl, like like couched up here with like Britain and Ireland. <laughs> it's intimidating. <laughs> it's, a, it's a privilege, I think, for us to have you know someone from your country. I mean, really, um, I, th I think it's one of the the beauties of the situation that we're in. That you know. Of course, we can't meet in person, but to have this type of conference from four very different countries and, and to come together, it's, so it's a privilege for us to be able to hear from you in Namibia and, and hear the different perspective that you've you've shared with us, uh, Janelle. So, okay, well, um, really interesting to hear from Chester. There's possibly going to be uh, some, well, there, there will be an important an announcement on African um, investment, perhaps in Africa, it sounds like, that that's a watch this space type issue. So, well, it, can I? Yeah, so it's basically reinfor reinforcing, reinforcing exactly what you're saying. You're helping with youth development, future jobs, security. You're helping with infrastructure. I think Africa, like India, will leap straight to mobile gaming. Um, so, uh, yeah. So uh, we'll be in touch very soon. <laughs> that's great. And do you think there's also possibility for? Say you know, Premier League football clubs to be the the esports e teams that they have. You know, there's obviously investment in football, uh, in African football from these clubs. Where be it in scouting, but do you think that also needs to be replicated uh, from an esports perspective as well? So, funny enough, I spoke on Thursday with Wolves football club and you know their biggest market is actually mexico because they've got mexican football players so i think each football club if they're clever on their esports strategy will mirror where they've got the most fans so um i think they're going to go for them first and then it might evolve out but they've got to get out of the mindset of just playing fifa they need to play other esports sure uh if I could just jump in on that, actually, um, I mean, ju ju just on Wolves, uh, I think what we've seen with football clubs is that their uh, their their following is player centric, um, and it's it's influenced by the uh, you know the the profile of their signings. Um, so so Ra Raul Jimenez is a good example for, for for Wolves and why they've got such a big big Mexican following, and you can see now that they're trying to look for opportunities um, within that. I think um, from from a, an esports perspective, what or, or even a gaming perspective, what um, what opportunities clubs have is to kind of look at their their overall audience, where the where the um, where the breakdown is of that audience, and then look at how they can engage, you know, with those communities. Um, using using gaming products whether that's at a at a, at a top tier level um like what we probably would have seen with, with um with psg going into you know sort of two teams man city with into china um uh, with, with with fifa online uh, and it, it's looking at those and even recently we've seen wolves kind of branch out you know of fifa and look at fortnite for example uh, and running running tournaments and it's it, for, for for clubs, and I say clubs, not not just football clubs, for for all clubs. It, it, but it's about understanding their audience and understanding what they're looking to achieve within those. And then, once they have that understanding, is how can they they create an esports or a gaming strategy that allows them to to integrate with into that into the, into those countries. Uh, Alex, can I can I add one comment to uh, your question? Um, what I believe is that your question should, should be two questions in the same, because one thing is, as uh, for instance, Trevor um, answered now, is looking at fan engagement uh, of football clubs. Another thing is completely different. It's player development. 
As you know, many, right, as you know, many football clubs and many clubs in England uh, bet on or do partnership, invest, because we are talking, again, are we talking about the partnerships or are we talking about investments? It's two different things, right? Because many, many sure. English clubs, clubs you know better than me or as well as I do, that uh, some investment in African football and it could be on, on South America. It can be in Asia, because they were mentioned in China. It's, there are investments towards player develop, development, right? Academies, and, and there is something that is a little bit far ahead on, on, or, or a little bit far in esports. Because uh, uh, it, what it seems to me is that we can talk only now on fan engagement and partnerships regarding brand. Right, and that's again, that's uh, industry, not uh, sports or not uh, uh, players, players, clubs, uh, whatever. Right? When you when you use that example, you must difference that. Yeah, this is an important distinction. So, yeah, okay. What well, can I bring the panel back to the? Yeah, this issue that we mentioned at the beginning, that of international collaboration, harmonization. So we heard sort of two different perspectives on it. We sort of considered it from a legal perspective in some ways having global standards can be useful. It could be useful for promoting esports as a, a sort of um, a recognized a, a, a activity that has um, recognition in that there are harmonized standards. Um, but of course, we also considered that there is a need to have flexibility for the way that different esports themselves function and, and the different needs they have. So, do you have any further reflection, panel, on on international collaboration and harmonisation? Would you like to see more of it, or do you think we need to keep the, the type of flexibilities we have? No one wants to advance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Go, Chester. Go. Well, no, I was just going to say. I think I think it's naturally happening. So what you, so what you've got, you've got the Global Esports Federation that's been around for five months, but they've got a heavily influence from the IOC. You've got the uh, International Esports Federation that's been around 10, 12 years. Uh, that's just done a partnership with Wesco and the Asian Esports Federation. So naturally, I think everyone is merging together and it'll be interesting, you know, is there different values? Will there be an ultimate coming together of everything, which probably will happen? Yeah, and what, what is the purpose of that? So I think ultimately there's some organizations that want to be known as the International Federation so that they get esports in the Olympics. And there's some organizations that don't worry about that. So. I think what will happen is there'll be a meeting of the people at the very top and they'll work out, well, we want to do this and we want to do that. I know personally from the IESF point of view, they want esports to be a sport. In my country, I can't legally do that. So everyone has its own fragmentation and stuff like that. But I think there's, we all want to be happy and help each other, but there's certain criteria or values that will be different. But I, I know, you know, Danny Cossey at Wesco, yeah, I know him very well. I know the guys at ISF and I know the guys at Global Esports. So I think, you know, they're all nice people and we've just got to kind of work out how that can come together. I imagine, you know, at the end of the day, esports, because it is still relatively new, it's, it's going to be, you know, as you say, it's going to take organic growth. It's going to take uh, that type of evolution, coming together, discussions, uh, conferences for, uh, for that development and sort of collaboration together. So, okay, um, another question for the panel. We mentioned briefly the uh, intellectual property rights and the importance of that to esports. Do you think game publishers have too much power in uh, by way of intellectual property rights? This is something that is perhaps unique to esports, isn't it, in, in terms of the the power that they have to, to dictate and obviously control um, how the, the game they've published is going to be. Um, yeah, yeah. How copyright exists over it. Well, well, from a, is the there right? It's, 
perspective, yeah. I, I can mention that we wanted to host the FIFA, especially the FIFA PlayStation uh, competitions, uh, which is tremendously popular in Namibia. Uh, but but uh, then we were kind of halted from South Africa side where they told us that they are having some difficulties uh, with FIFA licensing for events. Um, so basically, we realized that we were illegally hosting FIFA events and, and um, we needed to actually apply for licensing to be able to host FIFA console events. Uh, so that, that pretty much, you know, affected our decisions as well because we, we were very uncertain about uh, are we transgressing any, any laws or, uh, you know, like, um, uh, what do you call it, like rules from, from the, from the uh, producer of the game. Um, but yeah, so as I understand, you need some licenses to, to host FIFA tournaments. And um, yeah, we, we've had tremendous difficulty just like uh, getting behind the, the, uh, the gist of it. Uh, yeah, if I could just jump in. Um, all publishers, you know, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I'll leave that up to, to maybe to more to more intelligent people on the rights of IP, but in terms of uh, in terms of licensing, um, all, all publishers have community led license and then commercial led license. If it's community led tournament um, where it's it's run in a not for profit environment, um, you can be you know I'd be ninety nine percent confident that you don't need you don't need a, a license where it's where it's run where. For example, with the with the onset of COVID, for example, um, EA released some guidelines where if your production costs were greater than ten thousand and your price pool was greater than two and a half thousand, uh, then you had to you had to reach out for for a license. So you can structure it in a community fashion, which is probably more a grassroots level, or you can engage with EA if you feel it's something that's been run in a for profit situation, um, which is a commercial. You know, then it's a commercial offering to them. Um, I, I suppose just my point on, on publishers uh, and relating to IP, um, publishers, you know, especially in the esports scene, they they can control they control everything. I mean, they 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 are they are the rights holder. They are the, the gatekeepers. You know, they they will dictate the, the rules for engagement on how you know teams, you know, what sponsors they can have. That you know the the buy-ins for for franchise. Um, so. That that that's something that I think is uh, is is going to be interesting to see how that evolves over time and how how much power they will relinquish to uh, to international bodies to 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 you know to allow a bit of maybe independent thinking to come into the, into that. Um, but at the moment, you know, they are the gatekeepers and they set the uh, they set the rules. And I think it's you know our job our job as um, well part of our job in, in federations, governing bodies, associations, whatever we are. Is to is to understand those structures for both the grassroots scene and the pro scene, and how we can how we can support them within those frameworks. God, I've used frameworks a lot as a word, so there you go. That's my mindset right now. Yeah, so, so from my point of view, you know, they own the IP. It's that they've invested millions and millions of pounds, so that's fine. We we see ourselves as an amateur body. You know, we're not a governing body. We're an amateur body. We're promoting grassroots up, and they run the pro scene. Um, and you know, as Trev said, every game has a community license, which you know we have licenses for all our games, but the publishers know it, and we don't. You know, we're a not-for-profit, and we, you know, we adhere to all their rules. But they're very, you know, they're online, so it's pretty easy to do. But yeah, I, I totally respect the publishers because without them, we wouldn't have these great games. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they're the gatekeepers, but they have to have the incentive as well to invest originally and develop these games um, for esports. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Okay, any final reflections before we bring in Elias? All right, well, it's been really great so far. Wealth of information we've heard from you on esports. So if we could bring in now Elias Padjoheshvar. So he's actually been working uh, quite closely with Chester with his organization. So, Lies, thanks for joining us. Just Pleasure. a couple of questions for you, and then you may have some questions yourself for the panelists. So if you could just let us know a little bit about esports at UCFB and how you've 
since you've been at UCFB, what's been your involvement in uh, this? Cool. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's a really great opportunity to meet all these wonderful people in the industry, and uh, I'm grateful for it. Um, regarding UCFB, um, I'm currently in my second year as a student uh, studying football coaching and management. And we, when I came here, I, I kind of bonded with a few people over esports, made some friends, and we decided there was a big lack of esports at university. Um, lots of different universities have societies and teams and different titles, um, and they compete in two different university leagues, either NSC or Newell. Um, and we basically created a society, and now we have teams competing in those um, tournaments as well. Um, we ended up winning um, the FIFA the FIFA Championship recently, uh, one of our students, Tommy Miller as well. Uh, and we're kind of climbing our way up the university rankings and trying to bring more esports opportunities to the students at university. Fantastic. So, so have you got any sort of, obviously we've heard a lot on esports from a business and a legal perspective. Have you got any questions for the panelists? Yes, the yes, I do. I have a few. <laughs> um, so the first one I'm gonna ask is to Chester, because um, I did want to bring this up. Um, you recently uh, launched BTEX uh, in esports with Pearson, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so this is a three a level three um, qualifications. We so we talk about future jobs needing future qualifications. So they got a, uh, approved last month by the Department of Education. So this is a three BTEX of different kind of lengths. Uh, we're going to be going live in September, and then we've. Pearson have reformatted it as an international qualification. So we'll be going around the world selling that to start this September. So really exciting. We've had a lot of uh, input from the industry and from STEM teachers to develop this course. Um, yeah, so really excited. And it's just literally been launched a few weeks ago to start in September at an FE college level and for the schools that do BTEX. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, Question number two is to Trevor, actually. Um, Trevor or Chester or anyone could really answer this. Um, what might make the transition easier for someone who is kind of new to esports, going from traditional sports? Maybe they've realized, oh, this is something that I could be really passionate about. What can I do to get uh, to, to transition into esports? Um, what might make that transition a little bit easier from a working point of view and from a student point of view as well? Um. So from so from working in the esports scene, is it? Yeah, so going from traditional question? sports into esports. Um, I mean, at the top organizations within esports, you get the, you've got the same type of structures that 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 you have in um, in traditional sports clubs. You've got, you know, you've got your commercials. You know, uh, I saw the um, a good example would be like some Herb May. At Houston Outlaws, as somebody has transitioned into into a partnerships role with, with a major organisation, you know you've seen you've seen already the, the especially in the UK scene with maybe Gary Cook moving from Man City into Gfinity space that there is those movements between between traditional sport and um, you know and esports and the same structures exist um, where the opportunities probably are more prevalent, I guess, or maybe on the on the community and on the engagement side. Uh, where there's more of an emphasis on um, on content creation, um, on showing the gaming side, the streaming side, and I guess that's where, you know, at the moment you're probably seeing a lot, a lot more of the opportunities coming. But I think, you know, particularly, would say in my experience from from UK and Ireland, seeing you know the commercial side of it, I think it's just going to grow and grow. And I think the experience from those traditional sports clubs and rugby clubs will start to we'll see some some moves go around as as orgs become. Um, a bit more top tier and a bit more professional in their approach. Um, and I suppose ju just to finish that out, I think on the on the sports tech side of things, that's probably where the, the, the greatest probably innovation. I mean, just learning about your own technology tonight has been very interesting, but we've seen the likes of Edge, maybe GG, which has just been, you know, accepted into study Ventures, maybe as a, uh, as an example of, of a new tech rising in the space, solving problems around around contracts and payments. So esports is in a very fortunate position in that it's generally that the founders of orgs are, are digital savvy people and the audience is digital savvy. So they don't suffer from maybe the same the same parameters maybe that traditional sports clubs can be leveled at where it's, you know, 
you can accuse some clubs maybe or some organizations of have of having you know older boards that are not maybe in tune with their fan base but you can't you couldn't level that at esports organization which were being being founded by you know new modern generations that are you know digital first so good opportunities for tech i agree thank you for that um my first question is uh for chester again um could you tell me a bit about the the membership system that the british esports is launching Yeah, so we've been uh, concerned about having a safe environment for children to play with other children. Um, so we've been developing a system with Yoti, which is a government recognized uh, software which does facial recognition, but we're not touching the facial side, but more of an ID recognition. So we're going to be launching next month uh, a bespoke membership software where parents will know in the UK that kids are who they say they are and they can play against each other in a safer environment and matchmaking. Um, so that's kind of innovative, that's kind of at a high school level. Um, so yeah, I think once that gets going again, you know, we're very happy to share with other federations, you know, our learnings on that. But I think it's important that we create a really good safeguard environment and and kind of replicate what they do in sport. You know, that's that's the important thing that as a parent, when they see us, they probably do think we're a sport. So we've got to make sure that we have the same standards and values as kind of sport. Great. And uh, okay, one last question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sure. Elias. One, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> one last question. Oh, yeah. It's actually to you, Alex, and um, I'm sure you now can give some good input, and everyone can. Um, so you did discuss with you now about the importance of developing the youth. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, what kind of barriers do you think parents might face when it comes to allowing their kids to really, really get the the necessary time within esports to develop those valuable transferable skills? I think it's been interesting hearing from. The, the different countries and obviously I think this answer is going to it's going to depend on different countries different cultures and um, attitudes towards esports but I think it's you know, one of the things that we've seen and heard about today is that there is a value in esports and I think if parents do realize that you know this isn't just computer gaming but that there's a value in terms of team sports uh, there's a number of different benefits that I don't think I have the expertise to talk about, but in terms of, you know, I think Chester mentioned it, you can make comparisons to games such as chess, which we know are really important for intellectual development. And so I think, you know, if, it, if there is something of a paradigm shift that we're, we're not just talking about wasting time on computer games, but there is a, a, a significant benefit to that, then I think parents will hopefully be encouraging children to be involved in it more brilliant if, so. if i can add on that uh, i feel that if we can create a, a safe environment um, for for kids uh, that will also encourage like an educational uh, scene for for children to to tackle more educational games as well instead of like first person tutors and stuff and uh, that that encouragement can come from schools and parents alike uh, so that's definitely something that I think that everybody should aim towards in, in the development of esports. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just a couple more questions. We might have some more come in. Uh, so we've had a couple of live questions from um, the audience. So a lot of our students are interested in agency. Some of them are working in sports agency whilst they're at university so i think that's something that's quite particular to ucfb but um have you got any advice uh, on um getting into agency um particularly within esports so obviously again you may well be dealing with a younger um younger athletes but if, if you wanted to be an agent for esports you know, what, what would be your advice is it does it come down to networking again attending uh, the uh, the esports events H has anybody got advice on that uh well uh, probably uh, you will need to define first where do you do scouting of esports to find to discover new talents right uh and um but again you still need I sincerely believe that if you're talking about agency and a national level, 
it of course depends on the environment of each country, right? If you're doing it at an international level, for my perspective, it's too early to go for to go to that, because um, you only have contractual law. Uh, again, uh, you you always come to the to the same debate about okay, even if his sports is not a sport, even in that consideration, but his sports it's special, and you still don't have an international regulations, for instance, for transfers from clubs, for entering competitions at what time, for you have closed sy systems around each game, right? So, if you want to be an agent, you do agency in what? In League of Legends only? Or do you have to understand uh, in Call of Duty, in Fortnite? It's but that is only contractual law. And my question is, does contractual law, general contractual law, applies to the specificity of esports? <laughs> That is the question. I know I should I should bring answers, but I'm bringing <laughs> questions also. It's a, it's a great question. Sorry, and I, uh, I suppose we can always compare to Lex Sportiva. If you want to uh, yeah. I can I can add on to that if it's yes, uh, Alex. Oh, sorry, Trap. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and I appreciate that there is some there is some um, questions around international standards and transfer, but taking the contract law. Um, um, example, I guess, you know, from, from what I've seen, and I guess if the question is coming from a student, it's, you know, where do they get an opportunity to work in an agency in an esports space? Um, you know, in my, in my experience of dealing with two football agencies, for example, they, they have, you know, two top football agencies with major players. They have created a esports, esports divisions based on, um, people that have come to them with, with, with experience in the in the esports or the gaming world, and these two individuals working these agents put together a proposition for those agencies on how they could help bring in in a contract law basis. And I'm only talking at purely uh, not from an international government situation, but how they how they've created themselves mm -hmm. an opportunity in the UK to work with major agencies, and they have created propositions for those for those agencies about the skill sets that they can bring to it so i guess there's probably if, if that's an area students are interested in there probably is potential opportunities to, to to take that route down to it in that it's a very a very new scene people are still kind of finding their feet there's definitely sports agencies that are probably curious to learn about so it's it's like anything else if you're going to talk to these understand the space have your have your ducks in a row. If you've got experience in, in, in gaming, show that to them and then create a proposition for them. That's, you know, that's too good for them to turn down. But but that's, again, just not to step on Rui's toes. That's just me saying from an employment opportunity perspective and to create to create that space. But again, I think from an international scouting perspective, there's definitely work needs to be done. Great. Thank you very much. OK, so another question from one of our students, a Portuguese student, actually, Gonzalo. So he's asked, it's a quite a broad um, question and it's probably one that we could spend a lot of time on. But the issue of gambling in esports. So obviously esports can happen very quickly, the technological side to it. Do you think it's a good thing or does it um, need further regulation? Really, you might be. I don't know if you've got a particular view on this. Uh, no, uh, legal perspective. It's, it's... Chester, did you? Chester, yeah, it, it is already regulated. So I think the problem yeah. is that in certain countries, there, there, there is there is match fixing happening in countries, and we know that. And there's an organisation called ETIC that's been set up. Um, but you know, the gaming commission did a big study last year about esports. you know, their games of chance or sorry, games of skill as opposed to games of chance. But I think, you know, just on our own team, the Ravens team, you know, people do bet on it all the time. So it's a bit like any, any activity. So, I mean, I think, you know, the top players should be, you know, treated like athletes, you know, or, you know, top stars. So again, it's, it's, it is this kind of crazy world and different things, but I think there is regulation already around betting. 
Sure. I mean, in terms of the sort of, yes, uh, Trevor. Well, uh, I just think that, that and I think Ch Ch Chester is quite right. Um, I also think that the publishers do a very good job around the individual um, individual titles. So if you look at, you know, the the rules for teams in um, in League of Legends, you know, in, in FIFA, they're very protective of the, um, you know, of, of the gambling companies coming into that space or, or gambling partners, you know, which is probably the opposite to what um, to what traditional sport has, which is probably outside of broadcasting, very reliant on um, on gambling companies to um, to prop it up so um yeah it's uh the the, the the publishers do a good job in terms of markets every every sport you know whether it is chess whether it is everything has auxiliary markets that 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 um that that grow up around it and the actual sports themselves you know can control that you know that the, there's been lots of cases of match fixing in in, in recent times and if there's cases of match fixing, you know, in merging things, that means that the opportunity for for, for ill-gotten gains are obviously greater than the opportunity within the, um, you know, within the actual esports title themselves. So that's probably, you know, where where the structures again need to be kind of, you know, looked at things. And you know, apologies for the the disruption. A second ago, my it's my wife's birthday, and um, I've been I've been um, asked where I am. So there you oh, go. we didn't hear anything. Yeah, but... I need to go as well. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think we've reached the hour and a half mark, so I think I'll bring it to a close here. And I just want to say thanks on behalf of UCFB for joining us. We've really been honoured to hear from you. Um, it's, it's been a great um, it's, uh, insight into a variety of issues in esports and really appreciate the international perspectives you've brought. So thanks again. Thanks especially to Rui for, uh, it was originally his idea to have this, so special mention to him. Also Janelle, who's joined us from afar and traveled from Ireland, and also Elias joining us uh, as our students and Chester from the UK. So thanks again to everybody. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Thank